Hello, South Africa, and welcome back to CoronaCast, your twice-weekly show, keeping you up to date with the latest developments of the COVID virus in South Africa, as well as other useful bits of information that citizens need to be able to manage and navigate during this difficult period. Well, here we are today, day 85 of the lockdown, uh, day 19 of level three, and we saw earlier this week the president announce an easing uh, of what is now called advanced level three, whatever that means. We haven't seen the regulations yet, but certainly on the face of it, uh, a much wider opening up of the economy. The president addressed the nation earlier this week, and the speech was essentially a concession that lockdown has not worked and that this 85 days of hard lockdown, the hardest, longest and most brutal in the world, has come at significant cost to the South African economy and has destroyed the livelihoods of many, many South Africans. It's simply unfathomable how a minister like Lindiwe Zulu could announce publicly that she never knew how hard the lockdown was going to be on poor South Africans. The president seems to be looking, trying to portray himself as an innocent bystander in the economic chaos and mess that we're about to head into as a country. But the truth of the matter is they were warned in week three of the lockdown. We issued a statement. We made it very public that if you continue with the hard lockdown, unsuited to the conditions of South Africa, that many, many South Africans are going to be affected, uh, their, lives their lives and livelihoods destroyed in ways greater than the virus ever could. Unfortunately, those uh, pleas for sanity and a better approach uh, fell on deaf ears. And now we're going to have to live with the repercussions for many, many years to come of, uh, I believe, uh, poor decision making on behalf of government. And we'll be talking and unpacking just what the scale of that economic uh, crisis is uh, in, in episodes to come. But those of you who watched the president's speech as well would also have noticed that he bookended the end of his speech uh, with a, a commentary on the scourge of gender-based violence in South Africa. I happen to think that it deserves a press conference all of its own, but nonetheless, the president did speak out about it. Disturbingly, though, the president referred to a number of bills and amendments uh, that he was urging parliament to pass uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, the truth of the matter is, as our chief whip uh, exposed yesterday, there are no amendments before Parliament and there certainly are no bills waiting to be processed. If the president is serious about dealing with gender-based violence, then he's got to do more than pay lip service to it. He's got to put his words into action. If there are amendments, if there are intended bills, then he needs to bring them to Parliament as soon as possible. But I think it's disingenuous to try and put the blame on Parliament when in fact it's his own executive that since September last year, when uh, the gender-based violence issue first uh, really raised its head, um, not much has been done and there's not much to show for it. Time for talking is over, Mr. President. We need action on the scourge. You are the head of government. You are the head of state. You are the head of the executive. Bring these bills to Parliament. Bring these amendments. We'll help you pass them if they make sense and if they're really going to tackle the scourge of gender-based violence. But please don't hide behind straw men and uh, fatuous arguments and flights of fancy uh, in, in trying to cover up the fact that government's done very, very little over the course of the last few months, which is a reason why gender-based violence has reared its head, ugly head again in recent weeks and during the lockdown. And that's going to be the topic uh, of our discussion today on Corona Cost and it's on community safety, uh, but most particularly on gender based violence. In that vein, I'm going to be joined in studio by Nicole Merkin, who's the founder of Fight Back South Africa, a gender based violence advocacy group. Uh, and those of you who are familiar with the gender based violence activism world will recognize Nicole as. Uh, the champion who led the march to Parliament last year uh, in which she got President Ramaphosa to sit up and take notice of the issue of gender-based violence. And we're going to be talking to her. I'm joined by Zoom by our Minister of Community Safety in the Western Cape, Minister Albert Fritz, uh, to talk about what's happening in the Western Cape where we govern on the front lines uh, to keep communities safe, most particularly women and children. And then also from Zoom, our Shadow Minister of Women, uh, in the presidency, uh, Nazdi Sharif. Uh, really gonna, it's going to really be an action-packed show, 
and uh, on a very, very serious topic. And of course, we are open for comments, suggestions. Uh, please keep them coming in. Uh, we'll obviously can't deal with all of them, but we will try and get through as many of your questions and suggestions that you may have. So, Nicole, welcome to CoronaCast, and uh, we're really grateful to have you on here, and it's, it's great to, we're going to unpack uh, your segment of the show a little bit later, but uh, thank you for coming to join us in the studio, and it's lovely to see you again. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Good. Thank you, John. Yeah. Well, without further ado, I'm going to cross over straight to Minister Albert Fritz. Minister Fritz, welcome to CoronaCast, and thank you for making time uh, to be here today. Uh, and to deal with a topic that I know is absolutely close to your heart. It's a passion of yours, and that is community safety and keeping communities safe uh, from violent criminals. How are you doing today, Albert? Afternoon, John. Um, and afternoon to all my colleagues, um, mm -hmm. some on Zoom and some in the studio. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're good. Cape Town, beautiful weather today. Mm -hmm. um, really, really great. We're really good. Thanks for mm -hmm. having me. Good. I must agree with you. I know that our colleague Nasli, who's going to be joining us a bit later to the show, is freezing in, in an icy Joburg. Uh, Cape Town, nice summery weather. Does eh? lekker in the cup. Does buy a lekker in the cup. <laughs> Minister Fritz. And also, good uh, afternoon to all our viewers. Yeah. yeah. Minister Fritz, thank you very much. Um, well, let's just talk about COVID 19. What has been the impact of the coronavirus in terms of the safety and security environment in the Western Cape? I think we saw, firstly, when it was lockdown five, um, we have seen and heavy policing and, you know, from the military, the police, and from local government police, the city of Cape Town's, um, you know, uh, law enforcement officers, we have seen quite a reduction in crime in the, in the Western Cape as a whole. And that was obvious, that was quite logical because a lot of people had to adhere to kind of heavy lockdown rules where you couldn't even leave the house at 8 o'clock, all of that. Uh, we have then seen, when we've gone down from level 5 to level 4, still maintaining that kind of reduction in, in, in kind of criminality. But we've seen in that period a very interesting emergence of gangs looting food trucks and looting, you know, any form of um, merchandise that um, had to do with food or anything. And that was really increased. We also saw quite a number of burglaries increase, house burglaries, because the national police a minister had made this absurd ruling not to allow community police forums or to allow neighborhood watches to operate during the COVID uh, level five and level mm. four um, you know, lockdowns. Mm. And that really um, exposed a lot of our smaller uh, communities and our very vulnerable communities to real, real criminality. Mm. And I mean, we've written to the minister, I've written three letters to him, I've spoken to him about it. We have done a lot of advocacy to get them to allow neighborhood watches and community police forums just to operate. Just mm. even if you can just secure your own environment and your immediate environment. Farm watches couldn't operate. You know, um, we've seen how vulnerable farmers became during that period. So that was one of the kind of minuses, because we've seen an increase in business burglaries, um, home burglaries, and economic um, kind of criminality. But on the other hand, in terms of murders in Cape Town, and remember Cape Town is gang, a lot of gang-related murders, mm. that reduced dramatically over that period, mm. purely because we had an increase in policing. Mm. What we have seen as it moved on, and as, uh, you know, we came down to level three, we have seen also the impact of COVID, the virus itself, on our police force. Um, you know, many, many of our police officers were infected by the virus because they were the frontline people. Mm. Many police stations had to close. Um, the department, this dear government in the Western Cape, actually assisted the police in procuring some kind of, um, you know, a, a PPEs for the police, like basic things like masks which um, they just took very long, as usual, to procure. So, so I, we saw a very interesting phenomenon as it went, continued, that our, a whole lot of our policemen were infected. Our neighborhood watches uh, were still not allowed to operate. We also saw our, our LEAP officers, the law enforcement officers, has been infected. And I'm talking about 200 odd um, LEAP officers. I'm talking about more than 250 police officers. And in fact, in the Western Cape, 
today, as the today, we had eight um, deaths, eight fatalities by COVID of the police force. So all of that, uh, uh, you know, that increase, and as the, the, the virus ravaged our police force, we saw an increase in criminality. We saw the gangs re-emerging. In fact, this past two weeks, we've just seen massive gang murders again. Mm -hmm. We've seen the increase also kind of added with the kind of unbanning or the kind of allowance that uh, that alcohol could be sold. But again, it's not it's the policing of alcohol. It's not calling for a ban of alcohol. It's asking how do you mm -hmm. police it. So that's a very, very yeah. interesting Albert, so phenomenon. Albert, I, I want to ask you here. I mean, this is obviously an, an interesting debate that's been raging in the country for the last week. What is your experience with alcohol and crime in the Western Cape? Is there a correlation? Have you seen a correlation? It would be very simplistic to just create that correlation. But I want to suggest and I want to say factually we have seen um, when we allowed um, and when um, alcohol was kind of, of um, you know, with, when the unbanning or let me call it for the for lack of a better word, the unbanning of alcohol, we saw immediately a massive increase in, in, in murders in the province. The issue we have is not so much, and we're asking, don't ban alcohol ever. Don't ever try and ban it because it just doesn't work. You know, and it's so anti-liberal to kind of ban alcohol. What we need to do is to see that we get uh, measurements and measures in place to m ensure that alcohol is sold and, and drank um, you know, and used in a very, very responsible way. And let me give you some uh, practical examples. Not once have we seen anyone interacting with a liquor traders association. And I'm here talking about those guys who own taverns um, in, in our townships. Those are the people that we must make partners instead of just arresting them. Mm -hmm. And so we now in the process in this uh, Department of Community Safety, we're in the process now of meeting with all the liquor traders. We must also target our unlicensed um, liquor, um, our, you know, these kind of subbeans. And we must see why are they illegal, John? We can't just continue to mm -hmm. want to arrest everyone who's see why they're un unlicensed. Can we assist them in getting licenses so that they can become legal, so that they can adhere to the kind of protocols and the strict um, kind of protocols around alcohol use and promoting responsible alcohol um, you know, usage? And I tell you, the, all these people, all these uh, uh, um, you know, uh, companies, alcohol companies are prepared to come on board to become partners, to assist with education, to assist with you know, the way that we, we consume alcohol. And so we're very excited as a dear government to see it as another economic opportunity rather than punishing people and having this amazing draconian kind of approach to want to clamp down and ban it forever. It's just absurd. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think our experience shows as well when you do bans, it's the criminal element and, and the illegals that benefit and, and are flourishing. Absolutely. I want to talk a bit about gender-based violence. And I know that... Uh, vulnerable groups like women and children are a specific focus of your department. Do you want to take us through uh, a few, some of the programs that the Western Cape government is putting in place to deal with gender-based violence particularly? So I need to firstly say that the whole issue of gender-based violence is an all-of-government kind of issue in this province. So all-of-government. Under the leadership of um, Alan Windy, the Premier, and um, Shana Fernandez, uh, the MEC for, for, um, for social development, she drives it up front. And I think one must just start by making that point. The second point is, from a safety point of view, we have seen how many times women, when they go to a police station, I'm talking about you know, you know, the woman who's been abused at the house um, you know, by her husband, who's had quite a bit to drink or smoke uh, um, some, of, some kind of strange things who would abuse the wife and the children, and when she goes to report at that police station, they will either be indifferent to her or not receive her, you know, and, and, and we have had, in fact, a number of complaints, specifically over COVID also, of an increase in gender-based violence, but also domestic violence, um, you know, at our police stations. So one of the issues that we immediately, um, of, in fact, did is to look at how do we train South African police service frontline members to deal with women in a far more progressive and sympathetic way when people come. The second important part 
is we in an inspection we have done of a number of police stations in the Western Cape, we have found that the um, the victim room, the victim empowerment room, the victim, you know, when people arrive, that they go to a space that's far more friendlier, that's not as cold as a police station usually is, but that's a warm area normally supported by NGOs, that in many police stations, they don't have any of those kind of NGO type of community personnel to assist and to be the front person to assist the woman, uh, you know, as a victim. And in that regard, we're also looking now at how can we pay this type of via um, some of the resources that we have to assist in that in a practical way, John. Not to just, you know, to, to really practically make the woman's experience when they come to, to police stations. And then thirdly, very importantly, women must have a place to go to. They must be able to get a shelter. Um, and I must tell you, we have some of the best victim empowerment shelters in this province. I've, you remember I used to be the Ministry for Social Development. Mm -hmm. I visited those shelters and we have brought women from being victim into empowered individuals in the terms of a job, training and then get them a job. So I think um, there's a whole lot of, of issues around that. Mm -hmm. But I want to say a whole of government is always the approach to do and this DA government in this province will continue to see that as mm -hmm. a priority and all our departments will see it as a priority. Mm -hmm. And all of us will see how can we make the lives of all women far, far better. So yeah. that they, and men must be also be educated in the process um, and really be uh, made to sensitize. Boys must be sensitized. And we're running some interesting programs with the Chrysalis Academy around how do we also bring boys on board to respect mm -hmm. girls? And how do we bring boys on board as young boys, not to see their mother as the woman who just cook? But everyone has a responsibility in the house mm. to contribute to cooking, to washing up, to all of that. And start with that small little education to make a big change yeah. eventually. Because I, I think, think our children. I, I think that's, are, a, yeah, that's such an important point that you make because it's not yeah. women that are uh, abusing women and children, it's men. It's men. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of effort and in, in education and the like poured into, into the, the women's side of it. When, in fact, yes. it's the attitude of men that needs to change in this country. Absolutely. There's patriarchal systems, uh, treating of women as second-class citizens. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to eliminate that. And that education starts with our young boys. And Absolutely. as fathers, as uncles, as grandfathers, I think there's a responsibility on the men in society to be educating other men that that's not how uh, you behave and that type of behavior is, is not acceptable. Because... I'm sure you see this, it's, violence is a cycle. So a young boy that grows up in a house with domestic violence is generally likely to repeat that same domestic yes. violence because that is the imprinted pattern that they grow up with. So if we're gonna break yes. that cycle, the work of, of the Chrysalis Academy and so many other NGOs and CBOs and government, but also as parents, uh, is so, so important, uh, Albert. And this is why I think it's so important, the point you're making about community involvement and empowerment in the in the policing process in that space so do you have you noticed a, a, and i know you're a passionate advocate of community-based policing initiatives making citizens active uh, citizens rather than passive recipients and yes. uh, i know that's that's certainly why the neighborhood watches and, and programs like that are, are so well, well supported by you um do you want to take us through why you why communities are better at assisting with policing than just letting it uh, leaving it to the saps alone yes so so one of the issues that we've always <coughs> raised and i mean we raised it extensively during the COVID period is to get our functional accredited vetted neighborhood watches to be absolute um supporting the South African police service. Remember, they, they are in the Western Cape, we don't even have enough police officers. Mm -hmm. So if one can just get neighborhood watches to secure their own space, their own streets, you know, the local street, the local block, that's how we register them and that's how we accredit them. Um, we've seen when people do that, we reduce crime dramatically. Let me just give you a statistic. During this COVID period, we had more than 140 schools vandalized. Many neighborhood watches normally are based at schools. So because they were banned from being at schools, schools were broken in. Where neighborhood watches had a relationship with a particular school for more than 10 years, the school wasn't broken into for 10 years, John. 
Mm. Now, I mean, that kind of logic, you can just mm. see the impact of community owning mm. schools, not schools as some kind of um, building belonging to government, but it's the government, it's the community's buildings that community uh, mothers can go there for computer lessons, they can go for Wi-Fi, all of that when they want to go and send away um, kind of emails because they don't perhaps have Wi-Fi at home. That's the relationship that we need to continue mm -hmm. to have also in the space of education. And I want to say, Debbie Schaefer is doing a great job in getting mm -hmm. communities involved yeah. in some of the educational issues. And so we will continue to promote community police forums. They must just not become political. You know, and I think, unfortunately, in the Western Cape, we have seen how community police forums were affiliated to a particular political party. And, um, you know, and then we had the contestation between them and neighborhood watches. I think the idea of community policing is so fundamental and so important. And I can't emphasize more uh, mm. why we will continue to work, um, you know, with them. Let me give you another practical example. A neighborhood watch will first pick up a naughty boy in the street. There's a guy who's just been disruptive in behavior. They will pick it up first. We have said to the neighborhood watches, why don't you arrange camps? Why don't you arrange, um, you know, a hiking trip? We have beautiful mountains in the Western Cape. Why don't you arrive? Because some of those young boys in Mitchell's Plain, Kailicha, Langa, never get out of Kailicha. They think um, Nova Park, Manenberg, that's the space. If you take them to the mountain, they develop another relationship with nature. And they start respecting nature. They start respecting um, that you don't, um, you know, just... Um, um, you know, throw papers anywhere that you actually respect um, na uh, nature as a kind of ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I tell you, you will see the amazing difference and mm -hmm. we've done it. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important point about community policing, becoming not just people who arrest people, but also people who want to change people, who bring and assist with development of people, um, who empower people. That kind of role, yeah. and not just always arrest and arrest and mm. prison. That's why you know mm. prisons are universities of crime. Yeah. Get them out of prison. Keep well, them out of prison. That's our approach. Well, on that on that topic, um, I, I'm sure you're aware that the president is planning on releasing 14,000 prisoners uh, on early parole out into communities. We've expressed concern about that. That you're, you're releasing criminals into a already depressed economic environment, into an area where communities are already essentially struggling. And there's obviously a concern. Now, the presidency have said that they're not going to release dangerous criminals. Uh, but, you know, we've, uh, our Glynis Breitenbach, our Shadow Minister of Justice, has written now asking for a list of, the, of these individuals because we've seen so many cases where people come out of parole because the recidivism rate is so high in South Africa, it's in the 70 percent, that there's a, over a 70 percent chance they're going to commit crime again. Have you noticed uh, how many of the, of, the, of the crimes that you pick up are people who are repeat offenders? My friend, I can tell you now, John, every single girl was murdered in the Western Cape. Every single one. And we can give you the names. Every single girl who was murdered over the last few, remember, few months, a uh, year and a half, were murdered by parolees. By four, they were murdered by people who were released much earlier than they were supposed to be released on parole. And they were the, guy, the perpetrators of those murders, raped and murdered every single child. Uh, remember, with the last one, we had um, a girl in Alsis River where that girl was um, raped and murdered. Um, we have also had, up to now, during this um, amnesty period, uh, 1,200 parolees. I can tell you, everyone is blaming liquor. Let me tell you one other very big contributing factor to the crime and the wars of, that's ravaging here in the Western Cape are all those parolees that's been released. And as you say, all prisons, you know, I've worked in prisons. I, you work with the Office of the Inspecting Judge for more than 10 years. And we uh, inspected every prison in the country. Every prison, um, they are basically universities of crime. You, they, because there's just no capability. They don't have any ability to rehabilitate anyone. And anyone rehabilitated will come out perhaps as a very religious person. That, perhaps, that many times out. But I promise you, most of them just become hardened criminals. In mm. fact, a guy who goes in for a petty crime comes out far more bigger um, as a number gang gangster outside because he had to defend himself inside. 
And so he comes out as a 26 or 28 member or 27 gang member. And those members now, remember, they are outside, but they're operating outside, but they're not inside like in the old days. It's now in the communities. So there's no more line that uh, dividing line between prison gangs and street gangs. No, they're all one now. So, I mean, your point you're making mm. is that the impact of parole is on our criminal, yeah, just outside on crime and the rising crime mm. is absolutely phenomenal. And you know, Western Cape has a very big, strong culture, gang culture. So you can imagine the impact of the Western Cape mm. in that regard. Yeah. Albert, I, you know, just going back to your whole of government approach, um, and, you know, we've also seen a scourge lately of, of farm murders and, and some pretty brutal farm murders. And I know that you and, and Minister Ivan Mayer, who we've had on the show, yeah. uh, who heads up the Ministry of Agriculture, have been working very closely on looking at what can be done to improve rural safety. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I know that many Corona Cost viewers here have been very concerned about the spate of farm murders. In fact, um, that's one of the issues that we take very seriously in the Western Cape. Um, and we together, and, and that's the reason why Minister Mayer is driving as the agriculture minister. And you see the, the why we're taking it to see this because he's almost the kind of specialist in, in making sure that we have those farm watches operational and that they operate, that we work with agricultural organizations in the Western Cape, agri-Western Cape in the Western Cape. We work very closely with them and that that work with them um, to make sure that all structures are in place and the Department of Community Safety, in fact, as a technical committee working with um, the, the agriculture committee so that we can synergize and make sure that uh, we really get to the bottom and stop the kind of farm murders that exist um, in this province. But I think other provinces can learn lessons from it. And I think it's very important. Let me just make a very interesting point. We've taken out a number of what we call court watching briefs on farm murders in the Western Cape. And I tell you, when a judge or a magistrate is aware that uh, there's a, a court watching brief on a particular case um, and that we are watching the case, I promise you they absolutely make sure that everything um, happens procedurally correct, but no bail has been afforded to those guys. No, you, you hear what I'm saying? So mm. it's important to have practical points mm. in the criminal justice system yeah. that you can assist in um, really fighting the yeah. scourge of farm, on farm yeah. murders. Um, well, so having said that, we also focus a lot on <coughs> general rural safety. So it's any, it's all, it's not just in farms, it's also within towns, rural towns and the safety mm -hmm. of rural towns. Because mm -hmm. we've seen gangsters running away from the, the big metropoles to smaller towns where they perpetuate their drug dealing, their murders, their prostitution and the raping of women mm -hmm. um, in general. So it's a very important point that you make around rural safety. We need to be fast, a very, very awake, and work, again, whole of government, all of government approach. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Albert. I'm going to cross now to Nazli. Um, Nazli Sharif, uh, and uh, Nazli, thanks for joining us from freezing cold Joburg. Uh, you uh, have been tasked by the Shadow Cabinet and our leadership team in Parliament to head up the what we're calling the gender-based violence work stream, which is bringing people from around the party together to look at, at practical action steps, Nasli, that we can take to uh, tackle gender-based violence. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what work you've done to date and, and what the experience has been like? Sure. Um, good afternoon, um, John and um, Nicole in the studio and uh, MEC Fit. And, oh, all uh, your um, thank you very much for having me on your show. Um, so I think we need to start our bases by saying that gender-based violence and femicide is multi-layered and is multifaceted. And there is no one cure fix all sort of intervention that we can come up with or um, raise our magic wand and all of this will, will vanish. It's, that's not how it's going to happen. And we as the DA um, GBV work stream is very much aware of this. So what we've done is we've not only started as a base point to be more inclusionary and look at intersectional um, violence that happens. So John, you are aware that it's not only women that are victims or survivors of gender-based violence and femicide, but oftentimes um, members of the LGBTIQA plus community 
also face immense amounts of violence, not only in their communities, but from society as a whole. So our starting point is to be more inclusionary and more intersectional, looking at all the different layers of oppression that women or the LGBTIQA plus community faces. And when I speak about inclusion and intersectionality, John, I speak about how um, as a woman, um, you know, your, your financial, um, financial burden might be an effect on your, your, your status in society, um, looking at trans bodies and how society views them. And if we don't start at a starting point to say that we need to be inclusionary and we have to include all of these vulnerable um, sectors of society and then come up with one intervention that might be able to look at everything together. Um, so this is our starting point. Um, currently, John, let me start by speaking about the, the work that we're doing in the committee, first of all. Um, so we sit on the Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities Portfolio Committee. And I'm very happy that you spoke about um, uh, the President Cyril Ramaphosa and the fake news that he has been spreading in these press conferences. Because the fact of the matter is that the ANC government is the government that is withholding the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide. John, as you recall, we have been asking since we joined Parliament in May last year, after the declaration was signed by the President in 2018, we have been asking for the National Strategic Plan to be released and to be provided to Parliament, not only for oversight, so that we can see the timelines of implementation. Secondly, the 1.6 billion rand that this government keeps speaking about, we don't see it. We don't see it, John. And if you remember last year, when the president first announced this 1.6 million, we asked the DA, we asked the Minister of Women, Youth and Persons with Disability, Minister Mashabane, and we asked her, where is this 1.6 million being ring-fenced? We couldn't get an answer. We looked to Treasury for answers and we said, Treasury, show us where the 1.6 billion will be coming out of the appropriated budget and ring fence to departments to be able to deal with gender-based violence and femicide. Treasury says, oh, they, had, they haven't done it. So stop speaking about the 1.6 billion. Stop it, because until we see it, and until we see where it's ring fence, and we see that each budgeted item and which department they're going to, and how we're going to do oversight on that, we're tired of hearing mm. lip service. We, we really are. What, enough what is did, enough. What did Jerry the Maguire is, say? Uh, Show me the money. Show me the money, we want it in cash. Um, and and what, what we as the committee, what we're saying is, firstly, they need to release the NSP. They need to show us the implementation of the emergency reaction plan. It's a great words, it's nice slogans to use in speeches, but until we see the evidence, we're not going to buy into it. Third, we need to get the CGE to be better funded. John, now you know the CGE is a chapter nine institution, the Commission for Gender Equality, and they do really amazing work. So they look at law clinics, they look at interventions in workplaces, they look at empowerment, and they look at programs at universities and at school levels that deal with gender-based violence and femicide. Currently, this Chapter 9 institution is underfunded and they are unable to expand their reach, especially to rural communities. And oftentimes rural communities are left behind because there's not enough resources to, to, to bring them in and get them help and assistance where needed. The next thing we want is for the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities to be scrapped, John. This department literally does nothing, nothing. They tell us, we ask, what's your mandate? They say advocacy. Well, we don't need an advocacy group in government. We don't. We have advocacy groups. What we need is a Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities to have more implementing powers and to be able to have better strength and oversight mechanisms over other departments like policing or justice or education. Currently, that's not happening. It's just a waste of space, a waste of money. And we can use this money um, better to protect women and and the more vulnerable society, including the LGBTIQA plus community. Mm -hmm. Now, John, to get back to the work stream, um, what we've agreed on, so we just set up this work stream last week, Thursday. Um, so we are a week into it. Um, so um, I, I don't have um, everything and all the answers to give you, but what I can tell you is about the themes that we work on. So we have four themes um, that the gender-based violence um, work stream will be looking at. The first one is legislation and the implementation of the legislation. As MEC Fritz has mentioned, oftentimes we see um, 
how perpetrators and how keep going, going back out onto the streets and how survivors and victims' families don't get justice. There is a problem with our justice system and we need to start looking at where those barriers are and where those shortcomings are. So, for example, we need to start by making uh, legislation more accessible. And John, we've spoken about this last year. And this is why I get a little bit frustrated because the DA speaks about these issues. We are consistent on this matter. And then only when the trend or when, you know, the, 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 the narrative is starting, everybody then comes up and be, oh, GBV, GBV. But this, this is our life. As women living in this country, waking up in the morning and going outside or even being in our house is a risk just because we're women. So these are everyday issues. This is not something we only speak about when it's hype or when we're looking for clout. This is every day. And these statistics that we speak about are real lives. And they are lives that have been lost by the hands of men. Mm. So we need to start looking at those gray areas within legislation and looking at the uneven application of the law. The second thing is we need to make it more accessible and easily understandable. So when a woman reads a piece of legislation, she knows what she's reading. She knows what is covered and she doesn't have to go to a lawyer or an or external source to be able to explain what this legislation means. And this includes um, access to protection orders and, and accessibility to protection orders. But we'll speak about that in the fourth theme. Um, the second theme is looking at policies. Now, John, we have a progressive constitution. We have policies in place. We have frameworks, um, you know, like the Declaration Against Gender-Based Violence and Femicide. We have international protocols that we have that exists and that we have adopted. You know, I don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel, but we need to look at what we currently have and where the shortcomings of that is. So, for example, the implementation of the emergency reaction plan is not happening. So that's where the problem lies, is within the implementation of these, of these policies and of these frameworks. And then the oversight of these policies and of these frameworks is not happening because we don't have strong oversight models in this country. So what happens? Everybody, you know, gets to do what they want to do and then the scapegoating happening and nobody takes responsibility for what's actually happening. Mm. In, the, in the third theme, um, John, we speak about education and sensitization. So this is exactly uh, what you guys were speaking about earlier, is looking at where can we, um, where can we get to young people the quickest and, and the most efficient way? And that is in schools. So schools need to start having more, um, they need to look at their curriculum and start, you know, looking at what they're teaching, consent classes, um, tackling gender norms and gender stereotypes, um, dismantling patriarchy. This has to happen from the, the, the first instance of school. So we start right from the beginning all the way up to postgraduate um, so that, you know, we have that continuous information mm -hmm. and education on um, what it means, what consent means, what equality means, um, you know, what rape culture is, um, how men perpetuate rape culture, um, you know, all these things. And these are topics, you know, and some parents might be, oh, we don't want to speak about it. Yes, they're hard conversations, but we have to have them as a society. If we don't have these hard conversations, we continue the cycle of sweeping things under the rug and not dealing with it, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Our last theme is looking at uh, policing and the court system. So it has to be victim and survivor focused. We have to look at the corruption. John, how many times, and, and, and <laughs> I, 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 I get, emotional about this because how many times has women gone to police stations and reported their abuser or reported a violation on their body and the docket goes missing or the case file goes missing. Um, and we need to start looking at tackling corruption at the source so that when women go or women or the LGBT community go to police stations, they are not harassed by a system that is meant to protect them. And this is what we're looking at um, sure. as the works do. Yeah. We're also looking at the FCS um, and trauma units, as MEC Fritz said, we need to make it victim friendly and survivor friendly. Mm -hmm. So when a woman comes to report a crime, they feel that they're comfortable and they're able to speak about it and they're not intimidated or harassed mm -hmm. into anything. So um, court staff need to be trained um, and ensured access to legal practitioners for, 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 for any case, uh, 
based on gender-based violence and femicide, and also an online register of domestic violent court orders so that it's easily accept, accessible, accessible in, any, yeah. in any city or in any province mm -hmm. where you're at. So this okay. is currently what the Workstream is working on. Um, we will put everything together and we will submit it to, um, to the caucus, but this is the themes mm -hmm. that we're looking at right mm -hmm. now. We're working with many stakeholders from all different aspects of the GBV activism board, um, and we're hoping to bring something credible that we can implement as the DA and hold the ANC accountable. So, Nasli, I've got an interesting uh, uh, point here being made by one of the viewers that's, uh, that's watching, um, Patricia Ann Stern, and she makes the point that GBV and violence in general is a result of much deeper societal issues, and I think that's the point you're making earlier. And until these are addressed, and importantly, she says, the punishment befits the crime, she doesn't think that we're going to be able to tackle it effectively. What are your thoughts uh, on that? 100%. Um, I, I hear what she's saying. Um, but, you know, as, as MEC Fritz was saying, you know, we also need to start looking at interventions um, to stop the onset of violence. Um, to stop and, 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 and give interventions on the onset of violence. Um, we can't be focusing on punitive measures. We also need to start looking at what proactive measures we can start taking. So one of the points that I wanted to make, um, and thank you, Patricia, for your point, because um, it leads on to what I'm saying. South Africa has, I, I honestly feel as a woman living in this country, I live in a violent society. And I live in a violent society because South Africa has gone through a lot of trauma and a lot of generational trauma that is within our DNA. And so we, we deal with things in a much violent way. So what, do, what, is the, what is the DA saying about this? Well, we need to take mental health seriously. We have to. We have to. We have to ensure that there are social workers or psychologists at every single school, again, from ECD centers all the way up to postgraduate level so that those so, so, so that's more access for people and young people to have mental health practitioners but it's also important to have choice john choice on what type of mental health um, interventions you need and what type of trauma counseling you need and also to remove the stigma from mental health and once we can start doing this and once we start normalizing um, social workers and psychologists and therapists and healing um, maybe then we can start to see a change and a shift in society but, well i want to bring i want to bring nicole in now, Nicole, welcome, and you've been very patient and, and listening very carefully. You started Fight Back South Africa. Do you want to tell us a, a little bit about what it does, why it was formed, and what your journey so far has been? So Fight Back is a, is a non-profit organization which essentially goes into some of the most dangerous communities of the Western Cape and provides women, children, and members of the LGBTI society within those communities mm. with free combat-style self-defense classes. Mm. So essentially what that means is we're trying to create a system whereby we empower people in dangerous communities with the skills they need to change the outcome of a violent situation. It's an immediate way of addressing the crime mm -hmm. issues that the, the women and children and members of the LGBTI society are facing in mm -hmm. this country. And ideally, you know, with these skills, not only are we empowering these people, but we're also sending a very clear message to perpetrators that the time for this kind of violence is absolutely over. Mm. Okay, and now, I mean, I've known you for many years, um, but I was absolutely amazed last year when you uh, took up the cudgels on behalf of the uh, abused women in society, and you led a march to Parliament that got the nation's attention. I think it even exceeded your expectations, Nicole, and you got the president to sit up and take notice. Uh, he came out and received the memorandum from you. Um, has much changed since then? And, and, and do you think the march was a success? And is it something that we're going to see a bit more of going forward? So there have been some key changes since then, absolutely. Mm. We've mm. definitely shown that as civil society, we can have an impact and mm. a meaningful impact on government, on national government per se. Um, since the March last year and since we handed over the memorandum, we have seen the upgrading of several regional courts to sexual offences courts. We have also seen 
Um, we've seen several buildings being handed over to the Department of Social Development um, to become shelters for mm. victims of abuse. But beyond that, much like Nasli was mentioning earlier, we haven't seen where the 1.6 billion rand has gone. And that's quite unfortunate. Mm. And um, if you look back uh, just a few days on Youth Day, we actually, um, we actually hosted uh, with several other organizations a virtual online GBV protest. And if anyone watching this goes to the presidency's Instagram account now or any of these accounts, you will actually see that on Youth Day, hundreds and thousands of people posted photos of the names of all of the women and children that mm. have been slain over the past few months. So not much has changed in that mm. regard. Why is GBV such a problem in South Africa? Why is it one of the most violent societies in the world for women and, and children and vulnerable people? I think that there are many factors that influence the fact that we have such a big problem of gender-based violence in South Africa. Interpol has actually recently um, classified South Africa as the rape capital of the world. Um, I think as it stands right now, the statistics indicate that a woman is raped every 36 seconds in South Africa, mm. which is, which is sure. an absolute, absolute tragedy. And I think that the factors influencing this are, are multidimensional. I think we've got an issue with the way that we allow exacerbated perceptions within different religions, cultures, races, um, uh, schools, uh, schools of thought even. Um, we allow certain perceptions within them across our society to become exacerbated in a way that diminishes women's rights mm. and the rights of children in this country and the rights of members of the LGBTI society. Mm. And I think until we begin on a long-term basis to make an investment in the re-education of these mindsets, we're not going to see a very big change. Mm. So you agree then that it's, it's something that's, that's, that's an underlying problem that you've got to address uh, and you've got to completely shift the mindset and attitude, most particularly of men. And I think that's the, you know, that's the point we were talking about earlier, that it's men that are committing these acts, uh, acts of violence. Absolutely. And there's a mm. huge problem of impunity in this country. There's a mm. huge problem of men not having to face the consequences of their actions, and not just any actions. These are brutal, um, inhumane, atrocious acts against women um, and children. And I think, you know, Fight Back SA, although our, our main focus is, is empowerment and preventative measures and changing the outcome of a violent situation, we're also very involved on a legislative level. We're currently at the moment working with um, some partner organizations to draft um, recommendations for our educational curriculum, whereby we're proposing and recommending that we have to, we absolutely have to introduce positive masculinity and consent classes for the young uh, boy child in primary mm. school and for the young man in high school. Mm. And that will begin to see long-term change for the women of South Africa. Do you think we're still a, a very patriarchal society? And what can we do to break down those elements of patriarchy? Absolutely. I think we can begin to do that by looking at re-educating our society, by also empowering women in workplaces, in government, um, at a community level, at a societal level, but even in the home, even in the home. It, it really begins in the home. I mean, um, Minister Fritz was speaking earlier about how we saw the crime levels external to homes uh, decrease during the hard lockdowns in levels four and five. Mm. But the gender-based violence and domestic abuse calls <laughs> increased drastically. Mm. And that just shows you where are the crimes being committed? They are happening in our homes. Mm. It is our men in our homes that are injuring our women and our children. Mm. So we really have to begin to look at it, not just at a national level, but from a completely grassroots mm. and home level as well. Christelle Bester has written, she's watching the show, she says, police are not arresting men transgressing restraining orders. Uh, have you come across women who've gone the, to the courts, they've gone through the process, it's a traumatic, drawn-out process, they've got the restraining order, and then they can't get the SAPS to enforce it. Have you? Absolutely. One mm -hmm. of the most recent cases was uh, a young woman who was actually shot uh, by her boyfriend. She had gotten a restraining order for, uh, against him, and SAPS had actually failed to, um, to remove his firearm from him. And I think a few days later, she was actually shot by him. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I can share with you one of our most sure. recent case studies, if, if anyone watching wants to go look at our Facebook page. Yes, how do people we, get in we, touch with you? Oh, well, we, yeah. we are on, we've got a website, we're okay. on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're What's on Twitter. What's the website address? Our website is www.fightbacksa.com and just about the same name, mm. fightbacksa for everywhere else. But, but if people watching do go on Facebook, they'll see mm. we, we did get consent from a family very recently Mm -hmm. of a, a, an eight-year-old woman who was beaten within an inch of her life by a gang member. 
and um, the 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 this gang member, this uh, this uh, perpetrator, was actually caught by the police, and he was charged with armed robbery. And when the family of the victim, now if, if people go to our Facebook page, they will see the images of what this man did to this woman. She, she basically ended up in hospital needing reconstructive surgery on her face. Um, and you will see the damage that was done to her. And when the family phoned the local SAP station to say, listen, we don't want this to be a case of attempted robbery. We want this to be um, attempted murder. We want to press charges of attempted murder. And the detective in charge actually told the family, listen, if you keep bothering the, us, we're going to open a docket against you. That is the victim's family. And do you know what mm. happened? We were approached. We provided an attorney and legal help to the family, entirely free of charge. But the grandmother was so traumatized, that eight-year-old woman was so traumatized by the entire ordeal that she decided to step away. She said, I don't want to press charges. Mm. I don't want to take this any further. So what's so harrowing about that is this woman doesn't even become a statistic. So we can't even measure what happened to her. Mm. The, 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 the system won't even know about the tragedy and the trauma that she experienced. Yeah. So here we go. There's uh, Esmeralda Wrightson. How about there are judges at the small courts that are openly lazy to do the cases and keep postponing them till the next time passing the buck, causing huge frustration to victims, prolonging the pain and suffering. Uh, do you think that the, the court system is a problem as well? It definitely is. Mm. We have some women that are victims of violence that we are working with that, are, that have been within the system and trying to attain justice for mm. over nine years. Wow. Nine years. How can you possibly begin to heal and change your life and f even begin to feel empowered within the society that you live in mm. if it takes you nine years to try and attain justice? So how does policing and, and the court system, what, what needs to be done? Are you looking at specialized uh, policing units, specialized courts? What can be done tomorrow to start to turn the situation around from a policing and, and legal justice perspective? I think from, from those two perspectives, the first thing that needs to happen is the impunity needs to end. Perpetrators of these violent crimes need to know that if they are going to sexually harass, murder or rape a woman or a child in this country, that they are not going to receive bail. Mm -hmm. Last year in September when we led the march, the president responded and said that he agreed. He agreed that, we should, that the court should be opposing bail for, for rapists and murders of women and children. And that has not yet happened. Mm -hmm. That has not yet happened at all. So that is a very big factor that allows men to continue you know, making these crimes and doing these hor horrific acts because there's no consequence to their mm -hmm. actions. So that's the first thing that needs to change. The second thing that needs to change is our National Register of Sexual Offenders needs to be made public. Not just because we need the public to be aware of who these individuals are, but because, again, these perpetrators need to know that if you're going to do this act, you are not going to be able to hide from it. Mm. It also has to do with impunity, not having any consequence for your actions. And, and thirdly, these registers, also the child protection register, they need to mm. be populated. As it stands right now, I don't think a lot, uh, most of the public are aware, but it has taken seven years to only put 600 names onto the child protection register. And any woman in this country any member of our society can tell you that far, there are far more than 600 mm. child murderers and rapists in this country, and they're not Absolutely. even on that list. So when people get away with it, or people know there's no consequence, it actually leads to this encouraging of, of people to continue the behavior. And I'm sure, I mean, you, you get reports, I get them from my office, women going into police stations, particularly rural areas, to report domestic violence, which is you know, where I think it starts, as you said, in the home. And they're told to go home and sort it out. It's a, it's a matter for the home. And that's got to change. I mean, there's got to be, a, I think, dedicated police officers that are set aside to deal with somebody who comes in from the beginning to report uh, a, a domestic abuse case. Absolutely. Um, on Wednesday, the president said that there are now a thousand victim-friendly rooms mm. uh, across South Africa for people or women or anyone who comes forward to report such a crime. But a thousand is not nearly enough. Mm. A thousand in itself is just lip service. Mm. We need hundreds of thousands of them mm. to be able to tackle this issue with the urgency mm. that it needs. A thousand is, is not enough just for, mm. for a single day in this country where a woman is raped every 36 mm. seconds. And you would think a, a country that has such a high level of rape and would want to be serious about uh, making sure they secure prosecutions. You would know earlier this year, Andrew Whitfield took up the case of the rape kits. And it's found out that the majority of police stations in the country didn't have rape kits. Now, how do you secure a conviction if you can't 
preserve uh, the evidence as quickly as possible. Absolutely, and I think mm -hmm. that if we begin to look at all of these factors very quickly, it becomes mm -hmm. very evident that the oppressor in the situation, the oppressor of the women, children, and members of the LGBTI society of this country, mm -hmm. it's not just the men. At a certain point in time, it becomes the government that is not affecting the change. Mm. And I think that that is a very big turn that we also witnessed on Tuesday on Youth Day when we waged the virtual protest online. We saw that the presidency's Instagram account started blocking the women that were tagging the presidency in these posts. Mm. So it's very quickly reaching a point where far more than 20,000 people are going to gather outside parliament again. Mm. And mm. it's not going to be a friendly protest this time. People are angry. People are in pain. People mm. have lost mothers and, and children and daughters and sons. Mm. Just the other day, there was a story of, a I think he was four or six years old, this little boy who was so excited for his birthday, he was going to wear his Spider-Man onesie for his birthday. And the child went missing. And they found him a day later. He'd been stabbed something like 16 times by seven different men, and a boulder had been thrown over the little boy's body. What kind of society mm. allows these acts to take place? Yeah. How desensitized have we become? Oh, it's terrible. And, and just every time you think it can't get worse, you open the newspapers and there it is. It's, it's a more brutal, more violent, a more disturbing attack. And it's got to end in South Africa. We've got to break the cycle of violence. I want to say thank you for the work you're doing, Nicole. Um, you're an inspiration to those of us in public office. And um, I think we need to get more people like you into Parliament so that you can... <laughs> Uh, join Nasli and, uh, and, and uh, Albert in taking this fight right through to the, to the front line. And I want to give you the assurance that Nasli and our team in Parliament, wherever we are in government in the Western Cape, any municipality, uh, we take this issue seriously and we will work with people like you to, to break this down. But thank you for the work that you're doing. What we'll do is, is post your uh, details on the website afterwards, uh, on the clip so that people can be in touch with your organization and, uh, and, and see what they can do to help. If there's anybody out there who wants to help with funding as well, I mean, that's a big thing. We've got to start putting funding in towards these things. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we've got to put our money where our mouth is as well. But thank you for walking the walk. And I think that the women and vulnerable societies in this country have a very strong ally on their side in you. Uh, and Nasli and others. So thanks to all three of you for joining me today. I hope to have you back to come and talk a little bit about how things are going and uh, as, as progress. And Nasli, as the work stream starts to finalize those proposals, to be able to bring it back into, uh, into, into the, the public arena about what is, what is going on. But thank you for making the time today and, uh, and stay safe and keep up the great work that you guys are doing. Thank you, thank you. Well, there you have it, folks, a very serious topic on Corona cost today, uh, but certainly one that needs to be spoken about. And here's a message for the men in South Africa. The change is going to start with us. Uh, we can't treat gender-based violence as an issue that uh, is, affects women only. Uh, men have to step up to the plate and take responsibility. Uh, with, and it starts in the home, teaching young children, setting an example uh, that's how we're going to break the back of this terrible cycle of violence in South Africa against our most vulnerable officers. We must be protecting women and children in South Africa. Uh, we should be protecting uh, them from, from danger. But we can only do that if we start by making the change happen within ourselves and within our own homes. Um, so thank you to all of those men out there that are uh, leading by example and making the GBV fight their own. Uh, thank you to all the gender-based violence activists out there that are out there on the front lines making sure that this issue uh, does not fall through the cracks. But I think it also starts to open up an opportunity for a discussion about how we police in South Africa. It's very clear from all three uh, people who have been speaking uh, on, on the show today that there is a problem with policing in the court system in South Africa and that many citizens do not get the justice they deserve. And maybe it's time to start talking about how we can localize policing far more, how we can provincialize policing, to give provinces real policing powers, to be able to devolve policing powers down to uh, municipal council levels in a far more meaningful and effective way to enable those local provinces and local communities to adapt policing to handle the localized situation that they face. 
the crime situation in a province like the Western Cape is very different to the type of policing that is required in Limpopo. So simply overlaying a national policing plan over all these provinces is never going to allow provinces to be able to really get to grips with the crime. I think it's time to empower our provinces, empower our local governments with the real power uh, to be able to make their communities safe. But that's a topic for another day. I promised you an update uh, at the beginning of the show, and that's around hairdressers. You know, in personal care, you know I had my hair cut here uh, last week and it demonstrated how we could safely open up the personal care industry. Well, uh, the good news is that it has been announced it can open, but we don't have regulations. And as you know, we'd already gone to court. Uh, the minister was supposed to have filed papers by today. She has not. So we're proceeding with that case because we want to make sure that it is written into law uh, that this type of arbitrary uh, stopping of people being able to uh, uh, perform an economic function and earn a living in the personal care industry uh, is protected and that we don't at some later stage go back to an absurd situation. We're also waiting for greater clarity on what does this extended level three mean? If one looks at the uh, regulations as they currently sit, you can go to a casino, you can sit in a sit down restaurant, but you can't take your child to the beach. It's, you know, some absurdities that, that exist. Isn't it time now that we just drop this lockdown and focus on responsible health interventions, uh, social distancing, the use of PPE and mask screening, washing our hands, and empowering citizens with the information to be able to make their, uh, their contribution and to combat the virus. Yesterday, I asked the president in the house and encourage you to go on YouTube and, and look at the parliamentary question session yesterday. Uh, I asked him specifically why he's asked so many South Africans to make a sacrifice. And many of you have done so at great personal cost, your jobs, your businesses, your livelihoods, your abilities to provide with your family. And yet government is still not prepared to provide the modeling and data that has informed their decision making at this time. And we're not going to stop South Africa asking the questions until that information is provided. We've got PIA applications and we will go all the way to the Constitutional Court if that is what's required. But it's time now for government to start playing open cards with the citizens it's asked to make such a big sacrifice. Please join us on Tuesday at two o'clock for another edition of Corona Cost, where we'll be having another exciting and interesting show, keeping you up to date with the latest information. Until then, though, stay safe, South Africa.